Okay, very good morning. Tuesday, 28th of March. Just getting the briefing underway and, you know, what a difference the day makes in terms of looking at the markets this morning. You've got the DAX gapping up at the futures open. Uh, European indices on the front foot this morning following the recovery on Wall Street, which was, you know, caught most, I would say, by surprise. There was obviously a lot of emphasis on the back of this um, as, a, as an event to kind of be forward looking as to the probability that Trump's going to be able to deliver on bigger and better kind of fiscal policies going forward. That's why the healthcare bill was so important. Um, but it looks like the fallout has been very much contained. And one of the things here, just looking at the S&P this morning, you know, from the moment, really, we had a brief dip at the open on Wall Street. But other than that, it was pretty one way traffic to the to the upside and all the way up until the close and right at the close, pretty much. We had a bit of increased volatility into the to closing bell. We closed the gap just about. So, you know, the entire loss that was seen, the initial kind of nervousness that developed overnight in Asia, um, when, you know, obviously it probably would have been a portion of other traders globally uh, also uh, hitting the market, the reopening of trade Sunday night, electronic market on Globex, but then recovery very much as soon as Wall Street opened. Uh, a brief touch at the uh, very early European low and then a recovery all the way into the close um, with what, you know, in terms of actual news flow was a, was a fairly quiet day. Um, so a lot of people just kind of looking, trying to reassess you know, what was the reason for this? Obviously, you did have banks uh, yesterday get hit again. They were getting hit at the end of last week as it was looking increasingly likely that this uh, maybe not fail as it did or get cancelled, but certainly was looking to be quite problematic for Trump to, to get the repeal of Obamacare to go through. Uh, so banks briefly uh, entered into correction territory yesterday. Uh, that being then over a 10% loss from the earlier month highs. Obviously, they've been the sector which we've spoken about before that are highly susceptible to uh, potentially quite aggressive selling given they're one of the outperforming um, sectors, financials on the back of the kind of Trump trade uh, originally. Um, but they also recovered from their lows as with the broader market as we came back. And so this morning, still holding on to that kind of sentiment overall. So the 10 year bottom right also down around two and a half ticks sub pivot at the moment. Oil as well has made a, a was well, stabilized more than anything after, you know, fundamentally, obviously, the, the dynamic has been quite bearish for crude prices. Um, Certainly yesterday in the weekend news was really the same uh, on the back of the OPEC meeting, those several nations all looking to want to cut further on the deal in the summer. However, Russia not really looking to to get down to the nitty gritty of it until they see some more data come in. Um, and then the US output situation is still on the rise. But same kind of timing with that stock recovery and that probably helped as well um, with that equity move oil had a pretty steady climb all the way up into its traditional would have been respective pit close in around half seven hour time. Uh, and we're still up this morning. Currency markets though, um, overall a little bit more flat on the session, albeit we've seen a little bit of sterling volatility, which we'll look at in a, in a moment. Uh, but currency wise, the dollar index is actually pretty flat at the moment, trading at 99 at the moment. But Let's just have a look at this this move then. And you know, I think uh, Jim Reed in Deutsche Bank, they, he touches upon a couple of key things which we can expand upon uh, as to why the market may not have um, reacted so negatively yesterday. And we did see this recovery uh, across assets. And one of the first things is how the Fed funds futures markets are priced at the moment. Because if you think about it, you know, a lower interest rate environment or a slower um, rate normalization process being adopted by the Fed as what we have heard originally from the dovish hike that materialized uh, on March 15th. Well, market positioning has continued to change really since that meeting. Now, just recapping, this was a chart that I showed with you yesterday, but the market odds 
of three US rate rises in 2017. Let's not forget this is the actual projections from the Fed that they're going to do three this year. That was what they issued when they raised rates back in December. The odds, though, of them executing that forecast have now dropped below 50%. So that's the slightly darker red line there, which means now that three rate hikes is not priced into the market. Therefore, we are moving into a more accommodative environment again. The actual um, prospect of four rate hikes, which was climbing in interest, obviously post-Trump, the Trump trade, the, the, the inflation environment that that may have created, uh, and the associated then necessity for rising or raising of interest rates this climbed again as the fed got kind of uber hawkish at the time in order to bed in and cement pretty much to 100 percent that march hike but then they've backed off since that point so one of the reasons could be the fact that you know any sharp equity fallout could well be supported by the fact that from a policy perspective the fed can just ease off the gas and actually that gives a pretty strong signal to the market that you know Hold on, we're, you know, we're still going to be very slow, very gradual with the way that we do things going forward. And actually, you've had a couple of comments from a few Fed guys overnight. And if you actually, it's quite interesting to see then the evolution of the, the way the language has really changed. Because if you remember going into that March meeting, it was hawkish comment after hawkish comment after hawkish comment. Now you've got two speakers kind of overnight and last night. Fed's cap plan says interest rates should rise gradually and patiently. Fed's Evans says two rate hikes in 2017 may be right. So actually, you know, we've, we, we've swung back into this kind of, um, and maybe it is part of a Fed strategy in order to contain any kind of severe market shock on the back of a failure of Trump to deliver is that the Fed can kind of start to use their more dovish wordplay in order to soothe market kind of concerns in that respect. So, you know, definitely some of the Fed speakers started to err on that side of things. And then don't forget, you do have, and we'll look at the calendar uh, at the end of this briefing, a number of Fed speakers, including Janet Yellen, is speaking today. Now, I must stress, she is speaking on workforce development challenges. So hardly the most exciting thing. Uh, and unlikely to talk directly on policy or the economy, but nonetheless, Fed Chair speaking does always carry that uh, propensity to possibly say something uh, on the issue. And there are other Fed speakers today. Uh, some of the other things, though, are the dollar index, which is basically now back to where it was at the end of October. And, you know, if you start looking really at the euro, and I also want to have a quick look at gold as well. So... This is euro dollar and again this is something we were looking at yesterday in this the circle here uh, defining the US election that kind of massive wick was the volatility that was seen in kind of the early hours when the results were coming in and then you had the kind of buy-in in in the days and weeks thereafter of this this Trump trade as people focused on the fiscal element and the dollar rallied aggressively all the way down to really um, we got down to mid-December when we hit that low point. Uh, and, you know, you probably remember when we were kind of testing around this double bottom here, sub the 104 mark, people were talking about, you know, when are we going to get to parity? Because at that point in time, the ECB kind of talk was all about QE, um, the extension of that to the end of 2017, still being... Uh, very accommodative in their policy against the backdrop of the Fed where you know US core PC inflation was rising the economy is going to get an, 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 an added artificial boost on the back of uh, a stimulus provided by the Trump administration now we've had the complete almost opposite of that occur if you actually look where we are in current price sitting around this 109 handle which is exactly where we are this morning we've pretty much reversed the entire Trump move in terms of that specific pair. We are right back at net neutral to where we were really post that, that actual day itself. Now, so a lot of this is actually the market to reprice. Well, the dollar in terms of the FX markets, maybe the dollar 
You know, if you're expecting massive bout of dollar weakness, well, really, the, the pair is already repriced back to that point back in November. Now, obviously, this other part of the trade here that's changed a lot and may also explain some of the containment of the market fallout from this failure on the, the healthcare bill is the fact that underlying globally, the, econ the economy seems to be fairly robust. European data, we had German IFO, which is a key number yesterday. I think that was the highest since 2011, I think it was. The PMIs, the highest in six years. German inflation, the highest in six years as well, I believe. And so the ECB, if you were listening to them yesterday, are starting to do the opposite of the Fed. The ECB is starting to now sound hawkish and the Fed are sounding dovish. So it's, we, you know, we've kind of gone a complete 180 in, in terms of the actual central bank communication. And so hence the reason why this trend now is, it has flipped and we're now on the upside as the kind of Fed focus turns to a, a kind of slower, gradual path again, whereas the ECB start talking about things like taper, start talking about the ideas of potentially raising the deposit rate irrespective of the fact of keeping quantitative easing going all the way up to the end of the year. And so, you know, the thing, things have changed quite drastically. And if you look at gold prices as well, this was another thing um, that was coming into focus yesterday because we were getting close technically to that previous high that we printed at the end of February. We got around a few bucks short of that at 12.64 spot nine, which was obviously quite a key level. You can see on that, this recovery that has been ongoing over the last, uh, well, really few weeks. This is the last three weeks here that we've had a very powerful a surge in gold off this $1,200 handle, which has always been quite psychologically important. Uh, so getting up to upside those levels, we're around 10 bucks off there at the moment because we have pulled back a bit uh, this morning. Uh, but talking to a couple of the, the guys in the live room who, who look at this asset more closely, we're looking at the, the fib retracement of that high from really July when we got all the way up to uh, the highs which were 13.77 and a half down to that low that was seen on the 12th of December down at 11.23 or 24. So above here any break on that 65 handle probably looking at uh, 12.81 uh, on that fib level and then above there obviously the 1300 level psychologically with 06 marking the highs seen uh, 2nd of May and also going back to the beginning of 2015. So some interesting levels coming up in gold uh, in that respect as well. Uh, with that gold trade, obviously there's still things like Article 50 getting triggered tomorrow, of course. So the Brexit situation comes back to the forefront and then you layer in the French election, the intensity over that situation likely to increase in the weeks ahead as we get into April given that first round at the end of the month and then early May for the eventual second round as well. Another thing to be aware of um, and a chart you may have seen this morning from Deutsche, if I just transition my charts here, uh, was the fact that the S&P 500 has been performing similarly to how it normally does after a close election, uh, even if there was a small pop up in February. So what we're looking at here is the historical average, what we've kind of had in this more recent move, and, and generally speaking, although it did um, you know, diverge in price action during February, it has started to converge again as you know we kind of pull back a little bit from this uh, with this latest Trump information that we've had to hand over the last few days. And so actually, you know, if you look about on, on a historical average, when an election takes place, the equity market and the S&P does tend to rally. It's just that we've had more kind of volatile movements to the upside in quick fashion over February, when that was obviously when we got close to that 2,400 in the S&P, 21,000 breached in the Dow briefly. Now some of that hot air just fizzling out the market. We've kind of come back to what would be classically the more norm pattern or price levels at least. Uh, but suggestive that then the performance isn't outperforming that much. Albeit, though, one thing I do want to show you is that 
you know, there's obviously two sides to every argument. And if you start looking, scratching beneath the surface, you've obviously looked at reasons why the market is looking very overstretched on certain valuations. And some of the, the things that people are looking at are the small caps, if you were to look at the kind of underlying uh, health of the economy, looking at some of the, the, the other indices like the Russell 2000, for example, and traders hold the most short Russell 2000 bets now since the global financial crisis in 2008. Uh, small cap index slumps as dollar wipes out the post-election rally. Um, so essentially what I'm looking at here is Russell 2000 short contracts. You can see this period that we've just gone into uh, more recently as some of the question marks have started to arise on, on Trump's ability going forward following what's just happened and his commitment to follow through on those other more important fiscal reforms has led to a, a, a ramp up in these short positionings. So net positioning you can see has changed drastically really over the last uh, couple of weeks comparative to what we were seeing really once th this kind of phenomenal tax deal headlines were kind of flying around at the time. Uh, definitely something to, get, to keep an eye on going forward. Um, one thing for sure is that, okay, you know, when you look at this, this healthcare bill, it was important, not so much really for what it was in itself, more for what it meant going forward. Trump is likely now to quickly start to move market focus towards the infrastructure spending, the regulations or watering down of um, these kinds of issues around corporate tax reform, he's probably going to jump on that and start pushing that um, very quickly. Now, failure on those fronts, I don't believe would be as contained as what you've seen here, because ultimately that is the underlying do or die part of where the market really uh, caught hold of this kind of Trump inspired move that's taken place since the end of last year. Failure on that front. I think would look a lot different in terms of market reaction. The only thing here, if you are thinking about a Trump strategy, is if he can buy himself more time. As I said, the one thing that is happening that's underlying globally, it seems, is that economic data, certainly in terms of the US and in the Eurozone, is actually improving. And at a rate on you know, several measures that would be multi high year performance. And as such, if the economy continues to perform as the way it has and improve, actually, can he actually get away with the fact that the economy kind of does the job itself, even though he actually follows through with very, very little? Uh, that would be an, an interesting play. And obviously, the Fed would likely lend their hand to that by doing what they're doing in the last recent days, which is trying to then kind of shift market sentiment around the fact that they'll continue to be supportive of these markets by being fairly gradual and cautious uh, with their policy stance. Okay, so quick look at some other things for today. Uh, can't really go too far without talking about the pound and I'm afraid Brexit talk is going to be the hot topic again as of tomorrow. So, well, let's have a quick look at what we've had this morning is, is some quite whippy price action initially sold off, came back to kind of a classic on the pivot, had a little look lower before then ramping back up on really very little news. This has become quite a, uh, a familiar pattern to be aware of, certainly if you're trading the FX markets early on, you know, between 6 and 6.30, as soon as European participants uh, and UK start to hit their desk, you definitely see a ramp up in activity. But not a lot to really explain some of the price, the, the, the kind of seesaw price movement. Um, as I said, the dollar is pretty flat at the moment, but obviously going forward, tomorrow does mark officially the triggering of Article 50. And so what I found here is a timeline of what you guys are kind of looking out for. So um, after tomorrow, one thing that will be happening is that on Thursday, uh, Theresa May is expected to unveil details for the Great Repeal Bill. 
Now, I'm not sure whether you guys are aware of what this is. Obviously, it's very similar sounding to what we've just had from Trump. But again, it's, it's actually quite similar uh, in respect. Instead of trying to repeal Obamacare, we're just basically trying to repeal EU law. That's the kind of it in a nutshell, so to speak. Um, so just quickly, what is it? And I'll, I'm, I can post some links into the chat for those interested because this is what will be the paper's kind of main theme in the coming days. Um, so this is from the City AM, should really be titled The Great Repatriation Bill. In the first instance, the government is committed to using this bill uh, to give in effect UK law to all EU rules and regulation that apply at the time of Brexit. Uh, at the same time, it will end the supremacy of EU law so that Parliament will have the power to amend and repeal this legislation in future once Britain formally leaves the EU. Uh, what does it do in terms of its positivity? Well, it gives businesses in the short term some clarity of about existing rules aren't going to immediately change. We basically adopt all of the EU rules so that then when we go into negotiations with Brussels, we can say, well, at the moment, we're not going to change anything immediately quick snap and so you can continue doing business with us um, on the other side though some have suggested the government may use kind of very historic powers when incorporating the body of EU law into the UK law that allow ministers to change primary legislation government bills using secondary legislation uh, orders that go through parliamentary with little scrutiny um, so you know what some people are fearful is is that then parliament can just start going through and there are actually lots thousands of laws actually that are in existence in the eu there's no way that actually in terms of legal speak that the uk can go through and amend and implement every single one then into uk law so they tend to then go for very broad brush strokes but on the key points of let's say immigration for example and tax things like that and trade agreements they would then need to be ratified and spoken about within parliament uh, so it would need full parliamentary scrutiny on those more substantive kind of changes um, that may happen so that's generally what this is about to kind of make it a bit more sense from it so likely to hear a lot about that coming up <laughs> then though going back to the calendar you have eu president tusk uh, will by the end of this month have sent a draft negotiating guideline around capitals and then the ambassadors of those 27 EU countries will meet. European Parliament makes declaration on Brexit, so that's not actually going to happen till the 4th of April. Sherpa's meeting, uh, you may not be familiar with that term. Sherpa is basically a representative of a head of state. So the Sherpas basically all meet from these countries and they do the kind of groundwork, if you like, in these exploratory type of conversations these will happen you can see on the 11th the 24th and they basically lay the groundwork then for the EU summit which will happen on the 29th of April which is right at the end of the month so actually in terms of concrete discussions that will happen between Europe and Britain you might not actually get that really until the end of April obviously right in the middle of this you've got French elections also happening first round on the 20th, 23rd of April so a lot coming up now one quite interesting piece that I've I've seen one bank put out this morning um, and obviously every bank will have an agenda in terms of why do they put out research notes well you know they're likely they'll have a book which is in a position and they'll want to um, be passing on that message into the investor investment community but it kind of stood out because it's pretty aggressive in what it's calling for. And this is from Barcap. And one of Barclay, Barclays Capital's research greatest conviction now lies in the pound where they expect the trigger of Article 50 on Wednesday to initiate a strong rebound in the pound from historical undervaluation as ambiguity over Brexit recedes. Uh, they're saying that while the event itself uh, has been widely broadcast and the pound response is likely to be limited we expect this regime shift to initiate a sell the rumor by the fact rebound in sterling over the coming weeks and months they're targeting 130 uh, by the end of q2 and then sitting around that kind of low 130 area in the respective quarters thereafter i mean this is this is probably the most <laughs> most bullish 
of the calls that I have seen, most banks are on the opposite side of the table where they may have brought up their propensity of where they see the price selling down to, but they're certainly not calling for a 130 kind of short term rally. And if we start looking at the market at the moment, technically, so we're looking at cable futures on a daily continuation chart. So obviously we're encapsulating the EU referendum night itself. And what has been a big level in the futures at least has been that 128 handle, or in fact, just above there, 128.05.06. That's been key back, that was the defined the kind of immediate aftermath of the EU referendum low. That was the Tory press conference break and that led to one of the second biggest days of selling intraday that we've seen in a long time and that has really defined not just that support and then eventual break but the upside of this price range that we've been in really since we broke that mark back in October of 2016. We got close to it back in December the end of last year we then that 120 is the downside kind of uh, end of that range again retesting the flash crash low that was seen overnight during that Chinese holiday on the 7th of October. And then we've come back up close to it again before they're moving and to where we are at the moment at 126. So I would say upside before we even start talking about 130, 128 uh, is the really big level that I'd be more interested in. Uh, I would still say that for me, fundamentally I believe more that 128 will hold as an upside level and the actual trend thereafter uh, I think once these negotiations may get underway is the fact that actually the pound or cable will start to have a weakening trend with an overall target I'd be looking at more uh, as is what a number of the banks on Wall Street are moved back in toward the bottom of this kind of range so back towards 120 over the kind of coming months as really two things political uncertainty about um, what exactly is happening with this Brexit situation but then also rising price pressures denting consumer confidence and household incomes which is going to have a knock-on effect of slowing the UK economy on on several different uh, areas and so actually I'd be anticipating that in the kind of medium term to then weaken the cable pair but they're obviously looking at 130 I think if you get up to that 128 and you broke that then definitely I don't, you know that opens up I would say some pent up kind of demand I would say and if we snap that technically uh, it would seem quite reasonable then I reckon you'd have a run on 130 uh, or up to around those levels but I'd say that's definitely an outlying view at this point but certainly quite an interesting one uh, you don't hear sell the rumor by the fact that often it's normally the other way round um, but cable this morning on the front foot I had a couple of people ask me yesterday what do I think how cable is going to trade when they actually trigger it tomorrow quite frankly I don't think on the actual trigger itself nothing's going to happen what might happen though is for sure Theresa May I'm sure has a, a very strong commanding pro kind of Brexit democracy type speech that she'll roll out tomorrow to kind of you know cajole public sentiment that we are doing the right thing and she's fulfilling her mandate uh, in doing what the people of Britain voted for you know it would all be supportive of her widening the gap if you like of her popularity at the moment because ultimately she is um, carrying through with her commitment in you know getting brexit underway okay so quick look at the calendar then let's just wrap things up so coming up this morning it's fairly quiet there's not a great deal until really we get into the afternoon when it comes to economic data I would say overall economic data has now receded in its importance in terms of how influential it will be for a market impact. Really that's on two fronts. One, the next interest rate hike from the Fed, as you can see from the discussions earlier in this briefing, is moving further and further out. You know, probably June is now 
a possibility, but probably to a lesser extent. And then we start moving back to SEP, DEC, and so on when those um, new projections and Yellen press conferences come out. So trade balance today might cause some intraday brief noise for a number of minutes, but maybe not a sustained impact. Uh, Case Schiller is not important, very rarely moves the market, if ever. Richmond Fed manufacturing, probably worth watching, though these regional manufacturing surveys have been exceedingly strong. And consumer confidence, although expected to decline from previous, is tracking up at kind of uh, the most confident US consumers have been really since pre the financial crisis. Um, so a couple of things coming out in the US afternoon to be aware of, none of which I think is going to be completely game changing uh, to that degree. I think more so that might be influenced by how sentiment continues to play out on the back of really if Trump comes out and has any press briefings, tweets, things of that nature would carry, I think, more uh, ability to move this market at this present point in time. Speakers, there are a few to be aware of. Obviously, ECB speakers were a little bit mixed. You had um, Lautenschlager dropping a more hawkish comment only to be countered by uh, Peter Pratt, who came out and said something more dovish. Um, but it seems as though uh, the ECB, if this was, a, again, a, a central bank strategy they're starting to litter in some more hawkish tones yes they counter that with more even comments from other members but just the fact that they're starting to drop some subtle hawkish hints for me is quite a significant changing in the, the kind of where they're going when you start looking at the underlying performance of the European economy which is actually getting more and more solid as the months go by uh, so keep an eye on uh, comments later ECB's COA speaking on a panel discussion. Later, you got ECB's, or excuse me, Fed's George, Fed's Yellen, and Fed's Kaplan, and Fed's Powell. So a number of Fed speakers coming out. Uh, be interesting to see whether they stick to some of this more now dovish turn that we've seen from the likes of Evans and Kaplan uh, in the last 12 hours or so. Uh, so that's pretty much your calendar for today. Uh, overall, I would say markets at this point are fairly quiet. I'm uh, still a little bit surprised by the real uh, lack of Trump trying to come forward and kind of massage the market's kind of dented ego at this point over maybe just uh, the situation, the failure on the healthcare bill. It looks like, though, the markets have just taken matters into their own hands and, you know, with this pretty solid recovery that we've had reversing all of the losses in the S&P from the futures open last night on, on Sunday night. You know, we're kind of back into a holding pattern, waiting to see what he says next. It's kind of the state of play at this, mo at this moment. Okay, guys, going to leave it at that. So enjoy the session, uh, and I'll catch you guys in the, in the chat room. Thank you.